Okay, Erev Tov, everybody. Uh, on behalf of to our motion, welcome to part four, the final part of our uh, series with Dr. Gewurz on the changing nature of time in halacha. And I think they were going to continue our discussion of the international, really do most of the discussion on the international dateline. And then I think a little bit of um, odds and ends. So, Bakasha, right. Dr. Gewurz. Thank you. First, I want to thank Mel Berenholtz, uh, who was not on last time, but listened to the Shear online. Uh, and as he always does, he is an incredibly uh, precise and picked up all the little things that I misspoke. So, I am here. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> so now you, you can actually, if I do that again, you can butt in and correct me on the spot. But uh, I'm going to correct some of the mis. I, I said a couple of things uh, imprecisely, and I'll. I will correct them as we go tonight. Okay, we started last time uh, with what was called the circumnavigator's paradox. Two mythical, you know, I can't say mythical. I said, you know, uh, you know, two uh, two people, uh, not not real people, not really Aristotle and Plato, but people called Aristotle and Plato, who traveled, let's just say, uh, from Provence, one going across the Atlantic, across North America, across the Pacific, across Asia, and the other going in the opposite direction. And they both return to, uh, to uh, Provence and the person going west, every day that he goes gets a little bit longer. And you add up all those little bits, when he comes back, he's missing a day and he says, it's not Wednesday, it's only Tuesday. Of course, the fellow going the other way, like we would be going to Eretz Israel, across Asia, across the Pacific, across North America, he, his days are getting shorter. And the mathematics will tell you that as long as he's going slower than the speed of the sun, he is going to end up, when he gets back to where he started, thinking it is a day later. Of course, the people in Provence, know that it's Wednesday while they have one person saying Tuesday and they have one person saying Thursday. And uh, that was the, that was argued about. And as we noted, uh, eventually Magellan took the trip going West. He never made it back. He died in the Philippines, but his boat, uh, less than 10% of his original crew survived. They made it back to Europe and lo and behold, they were able to substantiate that their careful count of days was one less than the people who had of course stayed in Europe. Okay, and that's, and the question was, what do you do about that? And what happened, the world established a date line and an associated rule. Cross the date line going from East to West Next day, as soon as you touch the date line, go over, it's the next day, go the other direction, it's the previous day. And that, in a sense, solved all problems. And that was kind of the way things have been, uh, you know, with minor adjustments for various reasons. We'll talk about the one that turns out to be somewhat relevant. Uh, that's the way it's been for the last, you know, 150, 200 years. Now, the, uh, the question then becomes, well, that's nice. That's the international date line. Is there a halachic date line? If there's an international date line, is there a halachic date line? And we talked about various shitos. Now, let me clarify, uh, if I didn't say this precisely correctly. The Chazonish, based on a Balamor, that uh, the Gemara gives special significance to 12 new. 12 noon is 18 hours after the start of the day, which for calendar and dateline purposes starts at six o'clock. So 12 o'clock the next day is 18 hours later. There are 24 hours in a day the, by convention. By convention, the, the, if you go around, there are 360 degrees around the earth. So one hour, of which there are 24 into 360 is 15 degrees, which is roughly, and take the word roughly, very roughly, the size 
of each of the time zones. If you go across the United States, you would expect every 15 degrees, give or take, you're gonna change time zones. Uh, so the Chazonish, 18 hours, corresponds to 18 times 15, 270 degrees. Uh, I said that incorrectly last time. 18 uh, times 15 is 270. You go 270 degrees from Yerushalayim towards Europe, North America, across the Pacific. You get to a point where at 12 o'clock, uh, at 1159, that place is still gonna have a full 24 hour day. After 12 o'clock, nowhere on earth is there a full 24 hour day for which the Chazinish gave prominence to that Gemara and said, basically, that's the point at which there is an international date line. That point turned out to be in the middle of China, in the middle of Australia. So the Chazonish came up with a new theory that everything drags towards Eretz Yisrael. So if it's all of Australia drags towards Perth, which is on the Israel side, as opposed to Sydney, China drags towards Eretz Yisrael. But once you step off of China, importantly into Japan or New Zealand or the Philippines, you know, I don't know about Taiwan. I don't want to get into whether that's close enough not to count, but in theory, even Taiwan uh, would be a set, would have a separate time zone, which I don't think would prevent the Chinese from doing anything. But anyway, that's the sheet of the Chazonish. Uh, I also mentioned last time Rav David Shapiro. Uh, Rav David Shapiro uh, was a student of the Minchas Alazar, uh, the Munkacher, uh, who considered Satmar a pro Zionist uh, organization. He actually, unlike anyone else, he explicitly had a medrash. There is a medrash. Uh, I once saw it, I forgot where. I believe it's somewhere in the writings of Rav Mordechai Yafi is where I saw it. Those who are expert in midrash maybe can find it in the midrash. I'd love to find it. I I'd love to find it from, in Arisha and Rachran. As far as I know, I saw it. Uh, in one of the writings of uh, Mordechai Yafu, known as Lavush, uh, living in the 16th century, he actually quoted that lahalacha as to what's the ideal time for saying birchas, you know, uh, bir, bir, bircha, uh, birchas, Hashem, birchas Hashemesh, that we say once every 28 years. He said the best time to say it is nine o'clock in the morning. And he based this on a Gemara that said that at nine o'clock in the morning in Yerushalayim, that was the day at which HaKadosh Baruch Hu started the fourth day. So the fourth day started somewhere far from Yerushalayim. And when HaKadosh Baruch Hu started that day, it was already nine o'clock, which is 15 hours. 15 times 15, 225 degrees. As luck would have it, that fell less than five or six degrees from the international date line. He then adjusted it based on a, you know, he said we have to account for Ben Ashmashos, don't have to get into that. He literally almost fell on the dateline. So he was the most inventive of dateline Shitos. And, you know, there are many others, up to Kuczynski, 100 years slime is on the top of the world. So, and, and we'll get to more of them today. But the real question that we have to address is the dateline really a logical necessity? Or is it just an expedient solution to a baffling situation? In other words, we're baffled by the circumnavigators and people and what day is it? And the date line is a way to solve the problem. But the real question is, is it logically necessary? Do I have to rely on a date line in order to solve the problem? So what I'm gonna basically argue, and it's not that hard, that the answer is no. Uh, the dateline is an interesting way of solving the problem, but it's not absolutely necessary. If we didn't have a dateline, the world would continue to exist. Mankind would continue to exist. It might, you people might get confused as to what time it is and where they are and what's going on, but a dateline is a convenient way of addressing 
what otherwise would be confusing. But it's not a logical necessity. A person's affinity, in other words, if I am a thoroughgoing New Yorker, I can decide that the day is the day that's in New York, the time is the time that's in New York, and if I can't add or change the date or add hours if I'm in another city, that's my problem. But I have the perfect right to pick a place to which I have a personal affinity. And you'll see that's really how the dateline was built. Uh, whenever they had to change things, uh, when places moved from one jurisdiction to another, they would change the dateline. It wasn't a straight line. It would move in, as it had to in order to accommodate not personal affinity, but political affinity. If I'm Jewish, then I have another criteria. I use the Minagamako. I come to a place and that place keeps a particular day as Tuesday, a particular day as Shabbos, then I have no significance relative to the Minagamako. I can't say, you know, according to where I come from, today is whatever. Just like I can't do mulacha uh, if I'm a Ben Eretz Yisrael and I'm in Chutzlaretz, I'm not allowed to at least publicly violate the mores of the community. So in a similar way, wherever I am, I have to follow the Minagamoto. Dateline of heen, dateline of hair, I don't care about datelines. I only care of something, you know, the halachic equivalent to personal or political affinity, the minigamakam, that's one way to do it. Now, you think about it a little bit. Uh, if you travel from, I'm gonna have to Canadianize this, from Toronto to Vancouver, uh, you know, it's not me going to Seattle, you're going to Vancouver, you have to change your watch. So I, you know, spent a good part of my, you know, working career, uh, you know, flying to the West Coast once every two weeks. And I never changed my watch because I would have a sequence of meetings for a day or two uh, on, in cities in the West Coast. Most of the day, I was on the phone with people in New York or people on the East Coast or people God knows where around the world. And I, I would mark what time in New York time do I have to do I have these meetings? And I would mark the few meetings that I had on the West Coast, everything in New York time. And best I tell, no policeman ever came over to my calendar and said, your calendar is somehow politically incorrect. Uh, you know, you can't keep calendars like that. It's us or you must change your watch to the local time and keeping your watch on the non-local time is some sort of a violation. I think most people would say, okay, that makes sense. Well, if that makes sense, why is it that when I go to Beijing, I'm somehow to change to the day in Beijing? That, that is not fundamentally or logically different to going to a different time zone. The fact that I they, they face a different day is really no different uh, it's really no different than the person keeping a different time as I do. An hour or a day is not fundamentally different. And if you can somehow wrap your head around not changing your watch, you ought to similarly wrap your head around not changing the day based on what they're doing. Now, the circumnavigator's paradox is solved with a date. All right then everybody knows when they pass the state line, move your clock, move your day forward, move your day back. But what's really required is an explanation. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to have a date line. We have to have a terrace for what was going on in the circumnavigator's paradox. And the terrace we described last time, describe it again. The days are longer. We end up with one less day. Go the other direction, the days are shorter you end up with one more day. Oh, that's it. Now, if those people for the rest of their lives want to consider the day shorter, the day longer, that's probably not that good of an idea. It's probably a good idea that they both adjust to the time at the place 
they are, um, they're without the need for a data. Now, there are things you have to think about. Let's say that uh, Aristotle and Plato converted. I mean, there are two Eden now. They're not, you know, I don't know, we'll call them, you know, Ari and Pinchas. Uh, actually, Pinchas is an Egyptian name. So maybe we'll find a better name. But uh, Ari and whomever, uh, Paltiel, uh, and they're traveling and they both meet up on an island. What's going to happen? Well, same thing. Halfway around the world, they're going to meet up and one person is gonna to wanna to make Abdullah, the guy coming from through Asia to the Pacific and coming the other way, uh, you know, Paltiel or Plato, he's gonna to wanna to start Shabbos. So you're gonna have two people sitting on an island together, arguing as to what day of the week it is. All right, so they'll argue. Jews like to argue. So they don't, there's, you know, it, what day of the week it is, according to him, according to his cheshbon, Shabbos was a day ago, that's the guy coming from through Asia, and according to the person coming across America into the Pacific, it's a, it, you know, it, it, it's a day earlier. Uh, I'm going to start my Shabbos now. Now, that, not a problem, you know. There are a lot of times when two people disagree. If two people are wandering in the desert, right? And they lost track of time. What do they do when they meet? The answer is nothing. They haven't reached a settlement. They've reached a common point. And the halacha doesn't say, maybe there's a halacha that the Adam Gadol has to be listened to. But by and large, if they were both the same people, the halacha would say, all right, you, you've got to count. You've got to count. You know, bar Hashem for you, Bar Hashem for you. Everything is fine. What's the problem? Now, you know, if, if, if I'll give you a, a more real example, you have two Chabad Shalich. There is a Chabad Shalich, as far as I know, somewhere in the western part of Alaska. And there are certainly Chabad Shaluchim in the eastern part of the former Soviet Union and embed them, you know, you know, give them, you know, imbue them with the eyesight of Sarah Palin and they can see each other across the Bering Straits, you know, and one of them is gonna start about to make Kiddush and he looks across the Bering Straits and he sees his friend about to make Hapella. So, okay, if they like, they can imagine that there is a date one. Uh, the Dateline people will say, all right, there's a dateline in between the middle of the Bering Straits. By the way, there was a shita of a person uh, who was a Rosh Hashiva in the same place of, as from Shloyma Zalman Arbach, or Bion Mertzbach, who wrote many, many interesting, creative to the hilt uh, articles related to Zmanim. Uh, they're well worth reading. I don't believe that. He is the Posey Hakron on these things, but his creativity uh, is certainly much to be appreciated. He came up with a dateline in the Bering Straits. So, all right, so these, maybe these Chabad Hasidim, but the Chabad Hasidim are not really doing that. What they are really doing is the Hasid in Alaska, he knows where his bed is buttered. It's in Washington. So he's going to keep time like those of us in North America. And Chabad Shaliach in Eastern Russia, he's going to keep time, uh, you know, like his friend Rabbi Lazar and his friend, you know, Mr. Putin. So he's going to keep time differently. The fact that they are holding different times, they're not next to each other. They're in different places. So the fact that they are, that they are keeping Shabbos on a different day, now, how did this really, how does this come about? You know, this is kind of theoretically, this sounds reasonable. But let's say, just for argument's sake, and I think this is the right way to think about it, certainly from a halachic perspective. The world starts in Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is the center of the, the world, the center of the Jewish world. New people go out from Yerushalayim and they travel. They travel in one direction, 
towards Jordan, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, India, China, well, however far they go. What do they do? As they go, whenever the sun sets on what they think of as Friday, they start Shabbos. People going in the other direction, they also, when the sun sets, they start Shabbos. Late, late, they're earlier than Eretz Yisrael, and they're later than Eretz Yisrael. Well, guess what? As far as I know, there is no reference anywhere in Jewish literature of two groups arriving in the same place and arguing, one coming from the East, one coming from the West, and arguing what day it is. The whole world, by some miracle, were populated. Now, of course, there are people, places with no Jew has ever, you know, stepped foot. I, I'm wondering about that. It may, it may not be true anymore, but let's assume that there's, you know, Nebuch, some poor island in the Pacific where no one has actually set foot. But the point is, wherever there is a Jewish community, we have no record anywhere in the halachic literature that there was ever a machlokas. You know, so every place was settled by a simple rule. I'm going this way from Yerushalayim and I'm establishing a settlement. You're going the other way from Yerushalayim and you're establishing a settlement. You know, you do what you want, I'll do what I want. In the odd chance that two of us arrive with whole communities in an unmarked place, a place that is no, you know, no community has ever been established there before. But something that never happens, happens. Two communities coming in opposite directions arrive in the same place. So one community says, it's, I'm, I'm going to make Shabbos, and the other community wants to make Abdullah. So good. So you call in your local posse, or in the modern day, you, you know, you get them on Skype or, you know, Zoom or however you communicate with your local posse. You know, there, there's going to there's going to be internet access with satellites soon all over the world, and you ask your Shiloh. And by the way, there are Kloli Hapsa that will tell you what to do. The larger group, the more distinguished group, the one with more scholars. It, it, in other words, how a posek will, will decide that question. I doubt the posek would say, let's have two communities, just like we have Svart and Ashkenaz, we'll have Shabbos on Sunday and on Saturday, you know, or on Friday or whatever the case may be. Chances are they're going to find the psa. But we don't know of any such shuba. Never happened. And the world got populated. There are Jews everywhere that's relevant. So there's no problem. And that question never ever came up. Now, be careful. What I, I didn't say that there are no problems. I said that question of what the Minak HaMakom, the day of the week in that place is, never came up. That's very, very, very different from a related question about what about me? I go from, let's say, for argument's sake, based on this, place X is, you know, place X is going to start, is going to, is going to start Shabbos soon. And I'm coming from the other direction. And I think Shabbos is over already. I, I already had Shabbos. And I come there and it's like, hey, we're mamish in the middle of Shabbos. And I'm traveling. What am I supposed to do? So that's a more difficult shila of somebody who moves from place to place from a makom where he was, where based on that, he was able to keep Shabbos based on, let's, let's just say, or it's Israel or India. And he then comes to some places in the Pacific where the people, for whatever reason, are keeping American time. So he thinks Shabbos is over. They're in the middle of Shabbos. He arrives in the middle of the day. And there's a nice shyness as to what he's supposed to do. That is a wholly different shyla. And if we wanted to review the literature on those types of issues, uh, we would need much more than a four-part lecture. There are, you know, the, the, there are thousands of pages of chuvos written 
about things like that with respect to Hilchus Nida, with respect to the day of Abris, with respect to almost everything. And that's really not my, that's really not my focus. Uh, I will tell you that surprisingly, uh, you know, one of the people who was extremely machmed on that situation will surprise most of you was the Rav. So the Rav said, uh, if you go from a place uh, where you think, uh, you know, you think uh, Shabbos is going to be on Sunday and you arrive there and they want to keep Shabbos on, you know, their Shabbos, uh, you have to keep Shabbos on your day and on their day. And he didn't say which one is the Arisa, which one's the Rabbanon. He told a particular person to keep Shabbos for two continuous days. The person happened to have been a chaplain who was flying from Guam to Hawaii on almost a constant basis to, you know, tender to the Jewish communities of soldiers in those two places. And he explained to the Rav that, you know, it's hard enough to explain Shabbos one day a week. But if I suddenly now I'm going to try to tell people that it's Shabbos two days a week, I'm going to get into trouble. By the way, the Rav said after the first week, you only have to keep the minute a month. The Rav, as I heard, this could be urban legend completely, but I heard this from a relatively reliable source to be unnamed. The Rav relented. He said, just keep the minute a month. Now, that's the Rav. The Babacher Rebbe never relented. The Babacher Rebbe, without any Babacher Hasidim on the, on the call, May know, may know this, if you are an Australian and you travel from Australia to New York to spend Shavuos with the Rebbe, so what's going to happen? You're going to see an extra sunset. So the day before Shavuos is your Shavuos. The Rebbe would tell you, you have to keep three days Shavuos, your day, the day in New York and the day Yom Tov Shein. So you would have to keep your first day, go the other way. If a Lubavitcher Chassid went from New York to Australia, he would miss a sunset. And the Rebbe would tell him that he has to keep the day in Australia. Yom Tov Shein in Australia is Yom Rishon for him. And the day after Shavuos is his Yom Tov Shein. And I, this is not a question of, you know, of urban legend. This is the tshuva, which I read. You can find it. You know, everything the last Rebbe said is recorded. So this is recorded, recorded multiple times. So the Rebbe actually, okay, so I don't want, but this is not what we're talking about. Uh, let's not worry about travelers. Uh, travelers, you know, especially if we start getting into issues of Nida and Abris, you know, remember the baby, you know, two babies, three babies are born, one travels around the world one day in a jet, but one travels the other way. They do the circumnavigator's paradox in one day. Are there Bris in the next week on the same day? Or do you count the number of sunsets each baby thought? Interesting, Shilas. And there is on all of these things, and these things are often confused with the Shiloh of how we pass him. In other words, people will start cheshbening if this is Rav Kutensky or, you know, or, or, or the Chazonish, and they start making all sorts of calculations as to what to do. But the Shiloh effectively is independent of how you establish the day and the place. If you simply all come back to New York and travel in one and two directions on a jet, you have the Shiloh. And you, you know, regardless, you know, the, where the date line is, is somewhere. And there are communities that you pass that had a different day. So those Shilohs, we're just not going to worry about. What is similar to that, uh, which is a problem, which I believe in recent last 10 years did not come up, they change the date. So I, I believe, I don't know the, the names of the precise Western or Eastern or something Samoa, 
decided that it has more shaykhs with one place versus the other. So in the middle of in the middle of everything, they decided to change the date. As far as I know, there was not a Jewish community there now. There wasn't one there before. Somebody traveling there on business for the first time should ask his local rabbi what to do. My, you know, uh, unordained view is keep whatever day of the week you think it was where you came from. Until you get to a new makom where there are Jews, stay with what you were doing. That creates all sorts of problems if you fly from Japan to the United States uh, on Thursday night or Friday afternoon. Uh, you'll arrive before Shabbos in New York, but it may have been Shabbos for a while while you were on the plane, which again, Shilas to ask rabbis at a different time. The real place that's a problem for us is the Seward Purchase, Alaska. Alaska used to be owned by the Russians. And we bought that wonderful state. Uh, that's, by the way, how we got Sarah Palin. Uh, she came as part of the deal. Uh, but anyway, we bought the state in, I think, 1867, or I, if somebody knows better, you can please correct that. And the place had two problems. One related to something we talked about with respect to Rosh Chodesh, they were following the Kufot de Shmuel. They were following the Julian calendar. We, of course, went on to the Gregorian calendar. So the day of the day, the date, the actual date was off by 11 days or something, 10 days. So they had to correct that. The other thing, they kept the same day as Russia. So when they thought it was Friday, when it became the United States, it became Shabbos. The question is that we really don't know the answer to. Was there a Jewish community there? And if there was a Jewish community, but subsequently, as far as anyone knows, disappeared, I have not researched this, nor will I, but anyone really interested in looking at the history of Jewish communities in Alaska, as far as I know, Jews, Orthodox Jews came back to Alaska in the early part of the 20th century. I don't know if those, any of you who have been to Anchorage, uh, one of the most famous stores in Anchorage for a Jew is David Green's Furrier. His great grand grandfather went to Alaska from Jew with a beard and he set up shop as a furrier. And now he is, as far as I know, one of the largest furriers in the world. His grandson, now great-grandson, now runs the store. He's married to a young lady uh, of my daughter's age from New Jersey, which all of them know. They grew all grew up together. And, you know, if you tell them that you know his uh, father-in-law from New Jersey, you, like I, may get a discount. Anyway. Uh, so there's a Jewish community there, and they keep the American minhag. And the question is, they assume that whatever minhag may have been there, the Yemei Russia, in the old Russian days, has since disappeared. And as a result, they, you know, they keep the American minhag, and there are no Shilas. The only Shilas they have there are with respect to another interesting problem. You're so far north, when is Shabbos over? Which is, you know, another shear for a different day. Uh, I uh, had a large argument with the Shuliach there, and eventually I convinced him to ask some Lubavitcher Poskim who happened to agree, and he changed the Minagamakam. Uh, he became a little more liberal, uh, but not a lot. It, you know, it, it, anyway, it's a problem up here. Now, the, prob the advantage of this approach, there are many, many advantages that this approach has after, as opposed to having an absolute date line. If you have an absolute date line, wherever you put it, you can put it on the shore, on the shoreline, you can put it in the middle of China, you can put it in the middle of Alaska, you can put it in the Bering Straits. If somebody is walks, from one side to the other, 
can you walk in and out of Shabbos? As soon as you say there's an absolute line somewhere, how, however you define it, it's somewhere. So if you're standing on one side of it, you're celebrating Shabbos, you walk to the other side, it's Sunday. You walk back, it's Shabbos. So, you know, if, you know, Super Bowl is on, you walk out of Shabbos, you watch the Super Bowl, and oh, now I'm back, Shabbos again. You want, you know, I, I, I literally, I, there are postkim, real live postkim, who believed it was possible to walk in and out of Shabbos. But to me, I can't explain it. I don't understand it. I think it is almost invalidates the existence of so precise a line. The idea of Minagamakom and a group of people, you're not, we don't have communities like, you know, like I'm now in a suburb of Boca. We, we don't keep Shabbos in Boynton differently than the community in Boca. And I know of no place that's not widely separated where you're not gonna, you know, other than being Milchal Shabbos and using some mode of non-halachic transportation. I have to be careful these days. These days we now have halachic transportation. So using non-halachic transportation, you can't get from one place to the other. So Baruch Hashem, this idea of walking in and out of Shabbos is you know, not practical any, anymore. And it, we don't know of it anymore. And that's really the another, I think, intrinsic advantage of believing that the date line is whatever the Minagamakom established, wherever you, as you went from your line. The other interesting uh, problem with the physical date line is Antarctica. Antarctica is a large continent, uh, not, not widely populated. Uh, there are not a lot of people, but there are a lot of groups from different countries that populate different sections of Antarctica. And I assure you, all of those groups, they're not adjacent to each other, but they all keep the day of their parent company. So the American explorers, wherever the heck they are, they think it's whatever day it is in America. The Australian, you know, um, they keep Australian. How they adjust their watches, I don't know. However, if you believe there's a solid line, no matter where you put it, it has to traverse the Ant Antarctica. So what are you going to do? Now, you could theoretically have the line move all around and make a circle around Antarctica from one side to the other, but that would be very, very weird. Uh, Antarctica is a bit of a problem uh, that would require a very creative solution. And if you did that, then if there ever was an Orthodox explorer from a country, uh, he would have to hope that however you constructed your dateline, you put him on the right side, which is kind of not guaranteed. You're likely, if I have no doubt in maybe not my lifetime, but by the time my grandchildren's lifetime, there will be cruises to the Antarctica. There will be Jews. There already was one cruise that went to the outskirts of Antarctica. Uh, there will be Jews in an Antarctica and they're gonna have a big Shiloh. And you know, this, I believe what they do is what they used to do. But that's a, that's a, very, uh, that's a very hard thing. The other thing that would be very difficult is if islands in the Pacific say that we maintained ownership of the Philippines and China maintained ownership of Hawaii. I don't know if they ever did. Let's assume they did. Well, now what would you do? Philippines would want American time. Hawaii would want Chinese time. And things would go look absolutely weird. You know, you would have to build a really strange shape line to accommodate that, that's a real. Now, the other problem is we, Bar Hashem, have a large ocean called the Pacific Ocean, and we have an almost equally large ocean called the Atlantic Ocean. Now, were it not for the fact that North America 
has affinity to Europe, we could have put the date line in the middle of Atlantic, sort of, and we could have a different date here than England and Paris, but we didn't do that. But you can use your imagination and start to imagine different topologies for the continents, you know, going sideways around the world, uh, you know, being attached by a narrow bridge, you know, being a land bridge between us and Europe or us and Asia. And, you know, this could create all sorts of complexities for those trying to create a specific line. None of this would create complexities for those who follow Minagamako. Now, the one thing that I will tell you that uh, there is a very nice drush uh, of the Vilner Gom uh, that this throws into a bit of a quandary. Uh, for those of you who are aware, the Vilner Gom on the Kadesh Shabbos, the Israel Vazmanim, says that God is Mekadesh Shabbos, and he was Mekadesh Nessus Israel, but the Zimanim, this again is, remember the first talk, we talked about the Rav Shita, about whatever day we declare, that's the day of Yantif, that's exactly what the Vilna Gaon said, Mekadesh Shabbos, the Shabbos is set by God, God sets the Jewish people as the Amanifchar, and the Amanifchar decides when the various regalim are to be celebrated. All right, that's the problem is God set Shabbos. I just said, no, no, God didn't, doesn't set Shabbos. Shabbos is set by the first guy who got there with a community. It doesn't sound exactly like the Jewish of the Vilna Gaon. So what you have to say, and it's a little bit of a, I don't know what you call this, a dre or a you know crum you know heretz, God sanctifies any day that we call Shabbos. In other words, we actually establish Shabbos the day of the week, but who embeds that day of the week with kedusha? Embedding the day that we consider Shabbos with kedusha is something that's done by a kaddish baruch. All right, that's just, you know, that's the only problem that I ever encountered uh, with the idea that there physically is no dateline. Now, again, you know, it's not, this is not, this has not been expressed exactly this way by anyone. However, uh, if you go back uh, to, uh, I'll, I'll remember the Radvaz, late Rishon, early Ahra. You go back to Rav Sheol Natanson, the Sheol Meshiv. You go to Rav Yisrael Zalman Meltzer. You go to the Wiener Rav. You go to Rav Tzviv Hesach Frank. These are not minor figures. These are major figures, uh, as well as others who, practically speaking, uh, you know, end up with this psaq, including Rav Shapiro, Rav Kasher. There are many others who actually believed in date lines but effectively came to this conclusion practically. You have a really relatively significant, I would, I would have to say, certainly not a majority opinion, but a very substantial das yachid uh, that allows you to rely on any place. If you add to that all the urban legends about what different Oskim or different Gedoli Yisrael believe, you may actually get up to a, to a majority. Because I believe both the Rav and the Lubavitcher Rebbe believe that the Minigam Makom sets the day. In other words, it's the day of the week based on what people do there. And I suspect that there were other Poskim who also held that point of view. What is certainly not the case is the argument that you will see in too many places that having a date line is a logical necessity because it simply isn't. It is no different than changing your watch for a different time. And if you have a watch now that has a day on it, 
Okay, you, you don't have to change the day. You don't have to change the time. You just have to keep a careful calculation in your head. Now, a number of you may be wondering uh, what these three lectures have to do with each other. You know, the Jewish calendar, Satmar censorship, and Dateline. Uh, and the truth is, uh, I think that they do. Uh, and I want to sort of say some, this is, this is uh, I guess the recorder is on, I don't really care. I've said this in public many times before. Uh, I've argued this and I actually believe this to be true. Uh, we live in a modern world. And most of you on this call, I don't see any real Haredi faces. Uh, you know, there's, yeah, you're all having, there's, I see one possible white shirt, but I think even Rabbi Kelman's shirt is blue. Uh, the, uh, I, I actually got up uh, in a shul on an occasion not too long ago to speak. And there were about 50 men in the audience. I didn't see the Ezrat Nashim, but the 50 men in the audience were all wearing white shirts. And I was wearing a blue shirt. So I told them that I'm very happy that this is not before Pesach, because before Pesach, if you walk into the base medrash in Lakewood, everyone's going to jump up to sell you their chametz. So, you know, you have to, you can't be wearing, I'm actually wearing something worse than a white shirt. But nonetheless, modernity has a way of intruding wherever you want. In other words, people think that they are able to do whatever they can to keep modernity at bay. But in a mischievous way, modernity has a way of intruding on the lives of everybody. And the people that aren't aware that the world is changing, and as a result, the halacha has to be reapplied and do not admit to modernity and do not admit that modernity creates new ways of doing things expressing oneself, thinking about the world, examining the world, making determinations about the world, are less likely than most to actually take cognizance of them. And they, more often than not, will say things that are very anachronistic. And I mean this very seriously. When people read Gemara, read Rishonim, I can show you examples of 20th and 19th century postkim who thought in terms of modern concepts, which they superimpose on the way they read a text from a thousand or 1500 years ago. Now, when it came to the date, one of the things that happened, it didn't happen before, it happened in the last hundred years. One of the things we are completely, completely hepped up on, addicted to, is precision. Now, I'm not going to give an hour's share on precision. I did two weeks ago. If you go through the Talmudic literature, Gaonim and Rishonim, who did not have clocks, they were not, you know, as we are. Oh, my God, I have to tell you when, uh, you know, when Netzachama is to a part of a second. You know, they did not observe Netzachama with an atomic clock in the front of the shul. They observed Netzachama very nicely. They daven when they did, and they were not, they did not go crazy about exactly what time it is. The size, you know, they did not come back with charts and utensils to tell you how much more you have to eat or the size of matzah that you have to eat. This was all, in, in fact, the Gaonim said, the reason that Shiorim are given this way, because that you don't need a rabbi. You look at an olive, you look at an egg, and you decide whether what you're eating is the size of an olive or an egg. And that's the end of the story. In a similar way, in a very similar way, ancient texts, ancient, the precision that 
Chazal were careful with is nothing compared to the way we think. So as a result, if you go through the literature, of, of particularly the 20th century, you have all sorts of people, no, not gonna say more about the topic, who are hepped up on, oh my God, there are errors in our calendar. My point in that is, so what? Uh, as I quoted from the Rav, and I'll quote over and over and again, Yisrael is Mekadesh the Chodesh. We are Mekadesh the Chodesh by our observance of Yamim Tov. We don't have to be precise. There are examples throughout Shas. And again, another hour's worth, there are literally an hour's worth of examples throughout Shas, where Tanoim and Amoroim declared a day Rosh Chodesh or a day Pesach or a day Yom Kippur incorrectly. And they insisted that they be found because they said, we did it, it may be wrong, they didn't say it quite that way, but so be it. The power of Besdin to declare something as Rosh Chodesh is absolute. Correctness, we'll worry about that a different day. In the modern day, people somehow get very disturbed by such sugyas and come up with what we call in the yeshiva Beichterutzim to try to explain what may have been going on. So my first you know, desire was Chazal had two very important principles that they were trying to follow. And they did to a very, very accurate level. Uh, and the fact that it may not be perfect, way mild, way mild. Then I get to my favorite community, Sapa. They are people who hang out, you know, as far from modernity as, as anyone. Though again, I, you know, there are things about that community uh, and other Haredi communities uh, that baffle me. I know for a fact, uh, and I won't tell you who made the call, that some of, some of Reb Chaim Kanievsky's descendants use WhatsApp. And you don't use WhatsApp, except unless you're using a smartphone. So I think somehow modernity is finding its way into a lot of places and soon we'll have a kosher WhatsApp and we'll have a whatever. The prompt Sattler and many other people did not realize that the way the rabbis of the Talmud and Rishonim and early Achronim spoke was counting back from the end of Shabbos. We today, modern people, all count forward from sunset. So when they saw 24, 35 minutes, it never occurred to them that that was anything but Shabbos is over 24 minutes or 37 minutes after sunset or the beginning of Shabbos. And that turns out to have been a fundamental error. Now, I will tell you, those of you who study Sugyo and read Rishonim, buyer beware, be careful because there are many printed versions of Shas with the explanations and translations that do not do a much better job than Satmar, but it's more subtle. They're explaining a Gemara. All right, so you follow their explanation of the Gemara, and I can assure you, you have no idea what the Gemara was trying to say, because modern people have a tendency not to think of how many minutes before do you light candles before Shabbos is over? Have any of you ever heard someone say something like that? I certainly haven't. I, you know, everybody conforms with number of minutes after sunset. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a different way of talking. We're allowed to have a different way of talking. We don't talk Aramaic, not many of us. Uh, and we don't talk a lot of things the way Chazal talk. So, but realize that when you, again, learn ancient texts, Modernity has nothing to do with how they happen to have spoken. Finally, the last thing we talked about, talked about was the date line. And this is probably the most controversial. I, you know, the Shaila came up for the first time 
in the 19th century. As I told you, people were going to what was what was uh, West Eastern Russia, and the dateline had just been established. So there was a dateline, and people, if you read anything from back then, uh, what I told you was not believed. People believe if there wasn't a dateline, you know, the abyss is about to engulf the earth and we're all going to disappear. It's self coladoros. If you don't have a dateline, life does not continue. My own personal opinion, and this is obviously controversial, is this impacted the way Poskin thought as well. They said, well, if there's a dateline, there has to be a Jewish dateline. If the Goyim established a dateline, the Halacha must have established a dateline. All we need to do is figure out where it is. Now, there are people who said, yeah, there is a way to do it. What I described to you earlier, walk this way from Yerushalayim and walk the other way from Yerushalayim. And whoever gets there first gets to say what day of the week it is. End of story. There was never a Shiloh ever raised and ever written. So we're done. We know where, what day it is everywhere in the world. We never, we never heard of the dateline and we don't need to hear of it. But this to many, many people, uh, you know, there are how many ever you on the phone, ask someone who's not on the phone if they think the existence of a dateline is a logical necessity. And I will bet that most people will say, Without a dateline, you'd never be able to escape the problems that you encounter that a dateline solves. And so the common denominator uh, between all of this is modernity has impacts and they're much worse if you don't understand that. And the people that deny the, the, the reality of modernity are the people who tend to get trapped most dramatically uh, in the you know, changes that occur so subtly that people don't even realize a change has happened. With that, thank you all very, very much uh, for coming to listen. And we'll you know, hand it back to Rabbi Kelman to tell you about what's coming up next. Thank you very much. So I must say, you have a very um, different spin on modernity than we heard last night in Mark Shapiro's talk on the rise of reform. That was a very different approach to modernity. I, 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 I know. I mean, it's just uh, it's just cute. I, 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 have to, I have to listen on, online tomorrow. I think uh, I know it'll be on YouTube and on your site uh, right. by tomorrow. Anyway, yeah, no, I have to yes. talk. To, I have. I gave a sheer on this in a very different context with many many proofs of this. Different than different than bees, uh, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's not a very it's it's a, it's a difficult topic. Uh, By the way, I you but you didn't address at all the problem. The Charlotte did come up in in Shanghai. That's in the yeah, world of the up Mary in Shiva. Shiva. It came right. up in Kobe. Shanghai. They were they were fought. the Chazonish said he moved the line all the way to the end of China, and he said they can keep Shabbos even though Shanghai is on the other side. They can keep Shabbos like the Minagamakam, but he told the Jews that were stuck in Kobe, which is a significant number. Remember, you know, what's whatever, I'm sorry, I forget the guy's name. The Sagi Sagu Saguhara. Sugihari. Sugi Sugihara. He was Japanese. So he was able to get some people to Kobe and they couldn't make it back to China. They ended up in the United States, which is Nakba. So the people in Kobe were the ones that they got a telegram. From, uh, from the Chazonish that eat on the fourth and fast on the fifth. Yom Kippur that year in, in Kobe was celebrated on Wednesday and the Chazonish's telegram. Now, there is so much. I, I once mentioned to Mark this, that we really need a Mark Shapiro-like study of all the writings of that time because I... I, I read enough to know most of what's said is not true. In other words, he went to him and he told him this and the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Briskorov agreed with the Chazonish. The Briskorov would not give up Psalm. 
because he would not paskin. He knew that his father wouldn't paskin. His father would, would ask Rav Meltzer, you know, and, and you know, he didn't, you know, he, he didn't have him. I'm not Rav Meltzer, uh, what do you call, uh, the Brisker Pose, I remember, whatever is, and, and he tried to reach him. Rieger. Rieger, 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 right. Simcha Rieger. Simcha Zelig Rieger. Rieger. And he couldn't reach him because he was already Nebuch Nebuch in the clutches of the Nazis. And since he couldn't get a psak for him, Simcha, he would have taken a psak for him, Simcha Zelig, over the Chazanish and over Mr. Zalman and the whole rest of the world. And he would have told them, I saw you talk to Mr. Zalman. My father listened to Rav Yisrael. I mean, to Rav to Rav, Rav, Rav Rieger, and I'm going to listen to Rav Rieger. But you know, people say he agreed with Chazanish, which is not true. The other story, Rav Savitsky, uh, whose son is now one of the Rashi Yeshiva of Torah Vadas, he claims the Chazanish told him privately a few weeks before he died that he regrets the psalm. Nobody believes that, but who knows? You know, this, this is like, there are a lot of legends that are floating around around this topic. But it, it's, as far as I know, you're the only person in the world who believes there is no halachic international date. I mean, the, the little I know about the subject. Well, you know, I, I think in that- words, uh, the, Like Rabbi, Rabbi Schachter's question here on the, on the, you know, the chat box, like, okay, you're traveling. So what, what do you do? Like when, where, when do you cross the international date line? Like what- uh, what, you know? I, uh, what I tell, okay, so there's two independent shilas. One shila is where is the date line, right? And the other shila is what do you do? Now, when you cross the date line, do you daven again? So I claim that you keep whatever observance you were doing based on the observance of natural events. When you come to another city, you adapt that city's menon. And I've told, and I, I think a number of rabbis, significant rabbis who I've, who I've spoken to, after a lot of you know, examples, come to that conclusion. Uh, the idea of the person, the hardest problem is the person flying in and out of Shabbos, going from Tokyo to New York. Uh, and uh, there are people that don't get on a plane. Uh, you know, there are- Saturday people, night. I, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, they won't well, get on a plane Thursday Saturday night. night Thursday night. Tokyo. Oh, yeah, yeah. In Tokyo. They also won't get on Thursday night. Because in New York. In Tokyo. No, if you leave Tokyo Thursday night, I mean, Thursday during the day, you're going to... It's going to get... No, no. It's if you leave the States, I would assume. If you leave Tokyo to no, New York, leave, you'll... No, no. If you leave New York to Tokyo, it never gets dark. You're flying... I know, I've never the, flown, so I... I yeah, I no. I... I I, I, I will tell you just for, this is true. I was once in Tokyo uh, on Tainus Esther. Uh, so I told them that, uh, you know, there were Hasidim who got on my flight on Tainus Esther back from, uh, back from, they were, they had can't come to Narita from China and they were flying to New York with me on my flight from Tainus Esther. So I tried to convince them but they have to fast when it turns night on the plane. <laughs> they have to be up and be careful not to eat during those two hours. I was just having fun, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real, real problem. Uh, if you fly from Japan, you do fly through Shabbos. And there are a large number of postmen who permit it. And obviously there are a large number of posts who do not permit it. I never had this first. I fly Thursday night, uh, so which is you know which is it's, it's already night in Tokyo, and I'm I'm fine. Uh, the ne next thing I see is the next day, but there are people, and I am a very close friend, very from, uh, almost he has Haredi children, and he you know he's in business, and he flies from Tokyo, and he arrives you know Friday before Shabbos, but he has a problem. Uh, these Shilas come up. Uh, I had Shilas uh, from a uh, person. Why, why? Oh, it's a problem because in um, in Tokyo, it's Shabbos. There's, he leaves and he hasn't arrived in New York yet. So if he's still in Tokyo time, he sort Correct. of should have observed Shabbos, but he's now in New York time. Correct. So it's it's like, you know, it, it, these yeah, Shilas. I don't know why, why would that be a problem? He never, well, you know, if he leaves, Tokyo. if he leaves, 
Let's say he leaves 12 o'clock. Thursday night, off. Friday morning. Like no, 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 no Friday. Friday night. 12 o'clock Friday during the day. 12 o'clock in the afternoon in the, during the day. He right. arrives in New York 9 o'clock. In the morning. Yeah, I understand but that. It goes back. In, in between, it right. got dark. And the question is, when it got dark, I think, personally, I wouldn't do it. Because I think so it feel- gets dark. You leave twelve. I I don't know. You leave Tokyo twelve o'clock in the afternoon Friday. Why and will it you, get dark? It'll get dark because you're flying in the direction of darkness. It's darker earlier as you're going. So you're going to go. So how do you fly from go Tokyo to New York? You fly east or west? I'm I'm totally confused. I'm no, no, no. Do you like flying like you go to Air Israel? So you have an extra day. Oh, you're flying. You're flying. Like you got Eric. The other problem you have, which really complicates this, is in the summer, it's light all the way up. So if you fly north fast enough, you don't have a problem. So if you check the expected flight path, like for example, if you're flying now Newark to Shanghai or Newark to Beijing, there are many things where I've told people they don't have a problem in the summer. But don't do it in the winter because in the winter, you know, it really it's it's a very complicated child. I've gotten, you know, people sailing from people in the South Pacific with respect to jackets. <laughs> and I tell them, if you're a from Jew, you shouldn't be sailing in the South Pacific. <laughs> you know, they just drop anchor and they hold Shamas. They got an, you know, I mean, this, yeah. This is a variation of the question you didn't discuss, of course, when you're north of the Arctic Circle, when they Correct. keep Shabbos. That's a separate uh, issue. That, that is a, I, I plead complete ignorance. I, do I know, know the, it. yeah, there, I think for, I think the, uh, the, the Parak Yisrael, the end of the first Parak in Bracha, there's a whole discussion about that. Yeah, and the, if the, I the, remember the, correctly, Rav Shechter told us <laughs> that Rechaim of Elijah said you shouldn't travel north of the Arctic Circle, but that's a pre-modernity. Yeah, I, I will tell enough. you. I mean, I've never been north of the Arctic Circle. No, one, of, one, of, but, uh, one of my greatest discussions was with Rav Schechter, uh about this topic. And we reached a conclusion, not quite at the Arctic Circle, but my general view is that once Katsos Halila occurs, it's the next day. And once Chatzos Alayla divides one day from the next, at that point, Shabbos is over. And Chatzos Halayla, despite the fact that it never gets dark, there is a point where there is a Chatzos Halayla. I don't know how far north, but pretty far north. So you, if you go north of the Arctic Circle and you can still mathematically or astronomically you know, observe when Chatzos Halayla is, then you can use that as the beginning and end of Shabbos. You know, God forbid, uh, you know, uh, there are communities like in Amsterdam, there are Gezerot that you're not allowed to start Shabbos after eight o'clock, even though there is no halachic basis well, the, that, was the, that was the head there, Rav Pesach Frank, if I'm not mistaken, said it's that if you, you don't have right. to pass on Shiva Sabra Tom was past 9.30 at night. Now, well, I, I don't know here, where that came from. Uh, you so know, I, 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 where I, I, Rav, Rav Shachter told us where it came from. It came from the fact that since Shiva Sabra Tom is, is quote unquote, only a minhag, it's not really a real halacha, it's a minhag. Ratsu mitanim, ratsu mitanim. So, um, and when the minhag was accepted, no Jews lived anywhere north Okay, okay, that, that, that's, a, that's a good so I, I like wish that I, I, no, it's, I heard I, that one. No, so th- that already thing was said before, Rep. Rep. Shiv Pesach Frank. I think, and I think it's Rep. Shiv Pesach Frank that said that if you fly from Israel on an airplane on Shiva Sarvat Tammuz, you leave Israel to go to America, so you leave at one o'clock in the afternoon, you got a really long fast day. Correct. So no, no, you don't, you have, to don't have to worry. No, no, you can end the fast when the fast ends. Right, in right, right. And that's right, not the right. same with Shabbos and when the days, it's a different. Right, it's, a different problem. it's a yeah. very different problem. I wish it's I would have known that when I did spend uh, after my year in yeshiva, I spent Shiva several times in Amsterdam, and I wish I would have known that Shuva because I ended up fasting till eleven thirty at night, and I just was oh, unaware yeah. that I could have ended my fast at nine thirty. So yeah, well, yeah, that's a, yeah, no, I, yeah, I also spent I spent Tish above in Paris, uh, and I, I regretted that significantly. I don't. I don't think they say these at Tishbev. Tishbev obviously is more right, serious. Right. But, exactly. Um, but, 
But yeah, Shabbat Shabbat yeah, Tammuz, you know, okay. It's, 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 yeah, yeah, Shabbat Shabbat Tammuz, I agree. You know, mm-hmm. the, you can get in trouble going the other way. I once tried to be smart and fly the other way. Yeah, I've done that on Shiva Sarva Thomas. Our tour in motion yeah, you know, trips often, we you know do what them. happens. We had a number the of plane, them right after Shiva Sarva Tammuz. And I stormed. Been... And the plane flew the cir- you know, circumnavigated. It went almost, we went into the middle of Greenland. So it was late, it was light, longer on that fast day. So I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I don't think you'd have to fast any later than where you and went. I hear you. They I went going you. backwards. Or then, then, in other words, you, you leave Toronto, uh, I've had that actually a couple of times. I left Toronto, let's say, five o'clock in the evening on Shiva Sarva Tammuz. And, uh, you know, so you look outside, you know, you, you you save an hour off the fast, let's say, because, you know, you're flying, uh, you're flying. Right, right, right. But right. Um, if not, if they go some crazy route, so right, that, okay, exactly. the fast ends at 9.30 in Toronto. Shiva Sarva Tammuz ends a little bit later than 9.30 in Toronto, 9.45, right. depending on when, exactly, whatever, exactly. 9.45. So you... Um, so you um, yeah, you can end the fast at nine forty five. I don't think anybody would say you'd have to fast, even if it's pure light. You wouldn't have to fast beyond that. I, I don't. I, I really don't know. This not a you know. Can I ask, uh, a, can I ask yeah. a question? Sure. I, I was in Berlin. Berlin is very far north. Yes. Very far east, and Tisha B'Av ends there about ten thirty at night. I've never heard of this nine thirty. No, that's not on Tisha B'Av. They say the only Shivas are Tammuz. Tisha B'Av, oh. they say you have to be strict. But um, right, she was. I I don't know if anybody follows this in practice. I really don't know. I just know Rav Shach. And I also, it's, it's, it's different and, if you start and end in the same place, because regardless of what you think, you know, if you start and end in the same place, I think you would probably not find as many a terror. Right. Because that place right. probably established how it does things. Yeah, uh, and I, I, I just, I don't know. I've never really, I've never studied this. Was, this, is, this is for Postkin. I yeah. know. I, le- I left Berlin. My kids live in Berlin, and I, I left Berlin. Uh, to, I didn't want to stay there, Tisha because it ends at quarter to eleven. I, I will, yeah, I will say the year we had there, I went on our tour motion trip to Africa. So we went right after Tisha B'av, and then. Uh, like two weeks before Tishva, they invited me to speak. And but I I arranged a program here, whatever. We had booked our our, our tickets. But you Shiva Sarah Thomas, you want to be in, in South Africa. The fast ends at 5 30. That's exactly. where that's where, and that's that's where you want to be. Shiva Thomas. But okay, no, no. Anyways. All yeah, right. Can, Singapore is also very good. In okay. fact, Singapore but, is even better. Yeah. <laughs> But okay, I wasn't Zoha, whatever, or not Zoha. I don't know what the word Thank is. Okay. So is Brazil. I uh, yes. haven't been there. haven't gone that, uh, you know. Yes. Oh, I've, the, you know, yeah. yeah. I've been to Caracas with this this thing. I was, that's actually where I first got really interested in Zamanim. Uh, but, uh-huh. uh, you know, it was, it's, it's, I think it's eight degrees from the equator. So that's what I'm going to say. Probably a half degree. Well, that's why Yerushalayim is so good. Yerushalayim is never late. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, here in Boynton, we're south of Yerushalayim. So we also have very short. Shabbosim and fasts. Uh, Puerto Rico is that way. Anyway, it's talking about time. It's getting late. And we'll let yes, you go. Let I'm sorry. Know the changing <laughs> uh, time is relative, I know, of course. But um, And we look forward to seeing everybody uh, tomorrow. Rabbi Kowalski finishes his series on From Slavery to Freedom, talking about sins of the, of the desert. If you haven't come, I invite you. He's a very creative thinker. And tomorrow night, of course, Dr. Sokolo continues his series on the evolution of Tanakh. Thursday morning, Malka Simkowitz, The Jews of Ancient Egypt, followed by Shuli Mishkin on archaeology. And this week's Parsha here will be given actually by, by, by Noah Notice, who's a student at Princeton. Um, and uh, Friday, I'll give, please God, nine o'clock my share on the sitter. And then I mentioned earlier, um, then we'll, um, next week, we'll have a couple of new classes. We'll send you the information. Um, Menachem Kellner is starting a series on uh, the different Menachem Kellner, the, you know, the expert on the Rambam. Yes. The difference between Rabbi Huda Levi and the Rambam's approach to, 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 to human ethics. I don't remember the exact like title, but 
you know, the, uh, they have different conceptions of uh, our ethical uh, relations with the rest of the world, the non-Jews, et cetera. Of course, uh, um, he, he'll be talking about that. And uh, we actually are starting. It's not, we just finalized it today where, well, the details are not even up on the website yet. We'll be having a six-part series on Mickey Let Esther, given by Dr. Aaron Kohler, a professor at YU, who wrote a book a number of years ago on Mickey Let Esther. That's going to be starting a week today, actually, in the morning. And so we got lots of stuff coming up and uh, going on. And uh, okay, we look forward to learning with you and uh, invite a friend. That's uh, that's what we always ask you to do. Just invite a friend to come and join a class. And uh, everybody have a wonderful night, a wonderful uh, week. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. And thank you, Dr. Gewertz, for the series. Thank you very much. And uh, okay. You're welcome. We look forward as we to seeing you at some of our classes as a, a participant, as you yes. often are. So uh, thank you very much. Okay. I will. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Lila to everybody.